Okay, this is um, from the Congress of Science Editors. And I was invited by Dr. John Benfield, who's a very well-known uh, surgeon. And his English is perfect. I mean, I, I always thought he was American. It was only later I found out that he was actually Austrian. And he had fled uh, Austria in 1938 after the Nazis took over Austria. And he'd lived from age five or six in New York. And he is a good linguist, but he knows that he could not, even though his native language is German, he could not do a good presentation in German, at least not as good as English. So he asked me to take part in this. It was the 51st annual meeting of the Council of Science Editors. And to try to promote the idea of American and native speakers uh, supporting, scientific society supporting the uh, non-native speakers of uh, English in their medical paper writing. Today's topics now at medical schools and medical publishing in Asia, what we've done at Tokyo Medical, education publishing, suggestions to solve the problem in Asia, and global standardization. In Japan, English for medical purposes is usually taught by native Japanese speakers, usually who are not that good in English. And they almost never have any healthcare background. And they tend to fall back on their field in university. So if they studied Shakespeare in university, they teach Shakespeare to the medical school students, which is not what is needed. So even if it's taught by English native speakers, the English native speakers also rarely have any healthcare background. And they use educational materials designed for native speakers, not for special purposes. And they are generally completely inexperienced in medical editing. So even though they're teaching English in a medical school, they refuse to do medical editing. And they have got no understanding of the real needs of their students, what their students are going to be doing after they finish their residency and go out to develop a career. You've got no understanding of that. And in Japan, the English teaching in medical schools is usually limited to the first and second years. And there's usually no systematic English t instruction later. Third and fourth years, we have clinical lectures, polyclinic rotation in the fifth year, sixth year overview lectures, and preparation for the national exam. We have. We have English first, second, third, fourth years. I'm not saying that our students can speak English. I'm saying we teach English in the first, second, third, fourth years. But there's no structured writing course, either in Japanese or English, and no medical communication education. We do have a postgraduate course Uniform requirements or recommendations, peer review, handling reviewers' comments, electronic publishing, but it does not include practical writing. And unless people write and have their writing evaluated, they're not really going to learn very much. Um, in the 1970s in Japan, there was a very big language problem because there was um, very high scientific level, but there are very few accepted papers. Original research papers were published in Japanese, and there was no impact factor at that time, and so little motivation to publish in English. In 1982, that's about 30 years ago, I did a questionnaire throughout the country in medical and dental schools, we sent out, I sent out 430 questionnaires, uh, no more than that, about 600, 430 back. So, excuse me, I sent out 430 
got 48 back, 10%. Number of schools responding, even less than 10%. And the number of people interested in joining a medical foreign language education association were four people, including me. There's me and three others. It was very depressing. So I gave up for seven years. And then in, in 1989, things had improved a little bit. But still, it's not where it is, where it should be. Methods to address the problem in Japan, Japan's universities and in Asia in general. We need to develop medical English curricula like we're doing in the EU. We're, we're now involved with the EU in developing standard medical English teaching. Because in the EU, if you graduate from Portugal, a Portuguese medical school, the day after you graduate, you can go to England and get a job in the hospital in England, even though your English is very limited. And this has led to problems with uh, misdiagnosis or dosages. So we need to also develop texts and training of teachers. Smaller classes, we need more communications, more scientific communications among language teachers and basic scientists and clinicians. Medical school communication centers, like I suggested to you the other day, would also help. And more Japanese, Korean, original research papers sent to international journals. And what's happening now is that Japanese journals are becoming collections of case histories. The international journals don't want case histories, so people send their case histories to the Japanese language journals. GMU has about uh, 2,000 beds, um, three hospitals, 4,000 outpatients a day. Uh, we started off with a very low number of English papers per year, and we had an 800% increase by 2007, and probably about uh, over a 1,000% increase between uh, this year and 1991. That's how it's going up. And we have it as part of the uh, medical school lecture system. The, the students are in the hospital. We are in the hospital. And so we give them specialized clinical concepts created by our clinicians. The New England Journal of Medicine has given us permission to use all their articles for introductions, terminology, and doctor-patient interview skills. So we have a monitor room. And if we're doing respiratory um, medicine, we have a respiratory medical specialist in the monitoring room. And here you have the this clinician. This is the camera. And he's looking at the six classes with the different teachers teaching different, different groups, but teaching the same text. And so um, we have this uh, set, if you want to look at it, emp-tmu.net. And we have permission to use the videos of authentic doctor-patient interviews. Now, this is very unusual. It's the only one of its kind. They are real patient-doctor interviews, not, not um, special patients or uh, trained patients. These are real, live. The, the patient comes in. Sometimes the patient has a very strange accent, maybe from India or from uh, Saudi Arabia, Africa, or some remote part of Britain. And you can see these free at this site. So there's a move towards EMP education, standardization, including writing. Uh, this is one organization I, star I started. And this other Japanese, Japan Society for Medical English Education is trying to standardize medical, edu medical English education throughout uh, mm -hmm. Japan. 
and it has about 400 members, an annual congress, semi-annual journal, and has a national examination for proficiency in English for medical purposes. So that's basically uh, what I want to say today, that we need medical communication centers. I think it's essential in Korea, Taiwan, China, uh, Japan. And the problem of acquiring and training personnel is largely because language professionals, English teachers, are afraid of medical content. So if peer subject expert support were available, it would be helped. Added the above inclusion criterion to the patients and methods. Okay, if you've got lo local legal problems concerning doses, you cannot fight back, just take the situation. Some of these subjects were treated with, for 12 weeks with relatively low doses of donepezil compared to America. Okay, and as mentioned above, although the dose of donepezil may be low by Western standards, by Japanese standards, it is the maximum permissible. And it's in answering these, these two kind of questions that that's why it's important that the way I showed you yesterday, that there should be support for authors whose native language is not English, especially if it's not an Indo-European language. And you can discuss, well, why did you not give more than episodes?